Hey, welcome back to Sober Now. I'm Jim LaPierre. Today we're going to talk about finding yourself, or more reasonably, uh, developing an identity. One of the cool things that I get to do is I teach uh, courses in trauma recovery at a local university, and one of my students asked me, how do I find myself? And it, it kind of drives me crazy when people ask me that. I'll point at them and say, okay, I found you, you're right there, but the problem is you're not right here, right now. You're somewhere in your past or you're worried about something in your future and you're not really connected to the person that you are. So establishing an identity is predominantly a choice, but it's something that we tend to pursue as though it's philosophical or uh, this really strange undertaking that we're not really sure how to do. So for those of us in recovery, uh, most of us don't come from healthy families. And so the process involves a few steps. Uh, the first one, I'm often asking people, what do you believe that isn't true? We know that a child who grows up in an abusive family, a family that's uh, impaired by addiction, or a child who experiences neglect, learns things about their value, their worth as a human being, uh, their abilities, their talents, uh, from a very early age. In fact, a child as young as three or four has self-esteem, despite the fact that they don't really understand what self-esteem is. The child learns from the way that she is taught what her worth is, what her value to the family is, uh, what's good about her, what's not good about her. And sadly, an awful lot of us in recovery just have this overwhelming theme of not being good enough. And so I, I often ask people, well, good enough for who? By what standards? By what's, what's the criteria by which I'm good enough? And what I notice consistently is that most of us have two sets of standards and two different ways of judging. One for ourselves and one for everybody else in the world. So in order to establish an identity, I have to determine what were the things that I was taught about me that aren't true. I have to be willing to accept input from healthy people who um, see good in me, see things about me that they appreciate. And then I have to embrace the keep it simple system, let go of what isn't true, embrace what is true, and progressively um, integrate those things, decide what it is I want to hold on to and what it is I don't. I don't have to unravel my past in order to establish an identity in the here and now. I just have to look at what do I believe today that may or may not be true. And the way that I usually approach that with people is when they tell me something about themselves that feels uh, hurtful or unkind or mean-spirited, I'll ask them, who are the healthy people that agree with that? And quite often what they discover is that only, like people from their family of origin or only their past abusers, gave them those messages and would see them that way. The people that are in their lives today, the people that they're coming to know, have a very different perspective. And it's, it's very easy for us to dismiss the truth that good people have because it's uncomfortable for us to take that in. And so it's much easier for us to say, well, they're just being kind or they're just being nice. It's not true. Um, folks in recovery don't really owe us anything, but the best ones will tell us the truth regardless of how it's going to make us feel. So if we're open to inside, outside input, <clears throat> and if we're listening to our intuition about, does this person really believe what they're saying to me? What are their motives? Uh, we can slowly learn how to do crazy things like take compliments and accept praise and recognition and all of the things that we commonly kill ourselves to earn, but then deprive ourselves the right to receive. We can move past this and start exploring uh, what are some of the emotional obstacles that leave us uh, feeling poorly about ourselves or undervaluing ourselves. A lot of us get stuck in the injustice of realizing that what we were raised to believe isn't actually true. And so I want to point out that huge pitfall and say, let's, let's avoid that. Let's just choose our own truth and let's accept the responsibility that you and you alone get to decide who you are, what your purpose is, what your passions are. 
and we can break this down because identity is kind of a huge thing and there's some things uh, that we don't have control over. There's certain demographical features that um, I was born with and I can accept those. Uh, I have a physical self that I can accept and everything else more or less is a choice. I get to choose uh, who and how I am from this day forward. I get to choose honesty, integrity. I get to choose uh, that I'm a person who has a lot of empathy for others and I have compassion. But I noticed, especially early on, that there was this huge contrast between the way in which I treated others and the way I treated myself. So that's been a work in progress. I started out as my own worst enemy. I progressively became somebody who was fair to me, respectful to me, and that created an enormous number of possibilities. What I say to people in recovery is defining yourself or, or your identity can be broken down into pieces. So we can start with attributes, we can look at character, we can look at skills and talents and abilities, and gradually we'll gain an appreciation for those things. We will also find character defects. We'll find things about ourselves that we don't like or behaviors that we tend to engage in that need to change. And we have to be willing to enlist support and guidance from those who know more about that than we do to be able to make those changes. And as with everything else, this is a, a place where accountability is absolutely necessary. We're not going to do this on our own. And establishing an identity is not something that you're going to do just in your head. Uh, this is yet another reason why I'm a huge fan of journaling. Bringing things out into the open makes them more amenable to change. It's easier to spot patterns and negative thinking and false beliefs that we hold if we're doing this outside as well as inside. I need recognize that it takes an enormous amount of vulnerability to share these things with others, but I always point out that vulnerability isn't a black and white thing. It's not all or nothing. You don't have to tell people about all the painful aspects of your past to share with them the goals that you have from today moving forward. So whatever it is that you want to be, whatever it is that you most, how you most care to be, those are choices that you get to make. And my hope for you is that you'll allow yourself sufficient support and accountability in your life that those things can become more than just an idea, they can become actions, which become habits, which become really ingrained in how we live our lives and our way of being. I say that you're well worth that investment. I hope that you'll email me questions that you have about that, jim at sobernow.com. I hope you'll give us a like on our YouTube station, which is Sober Now. And I hope that you'll share this with friends and family so that we can continue this conversation and do more cool things around recovery. Thanks.